uh, he was rather interested in how I went about making my butterfly courses. And I've taught a number of butterfly courses of varying lengths. And so I kind of put together what I think is important when considering how to make a butterfly course. Although, a lot of the guidelines I give tonight could be applicable to making a good bird course, a good plant course, a good mycology course, what have you. Um, but these are some of, the, some of the factors. So kind of going through my own experience here, I've led numerous day classes through the University of Washington biology classes, the intro biology class, biology 180 is where every student is required to take a one day field trip so that we get the students out of the classroom, out of the lab, so they can see the biology that happens around them. I lead bird walks right outside here at Unibay Natural Area so that, you know, when we, on a test, when we ask them, name a species that exhibits sexual dimorphism, they don't say, don't give me an exotic answer like a lion or a peacock. They say, that duck in the fountain <laughs> means they're actually paying attention to it. Um, so in spring and summer, I take them on butterfly trips to eastern Washington in the spring and the Cascades uh, in summer. Um, we've done, I've done weekend seminars. My first butterfly class was with Bob Pyle. Uh, I'm trying to lead a weekend seminar at North Cascades Institute. I'm sure many of you have taken weekend seminars as well. How many of you, just by show of hands, have taken a class with Bob Pyle, like the actual seminar? Bob, you got three people raising their hands in here. Um, you got, I've taught a weekly seminar, so this is, you know, one class a week, plus field trips uh, through the Seattle Audubon Society of Mountaineers. I led that through the Seattle Audubon Society, kind of in memoriam of Heidi Olsh, kind of continuing her class. We can continue to get new students here, uh, new butterfly enthusiasts. Um, I took a week-long course with Paul Oppler in California, which I'll be kind of contrasting my methods with and seeing uh, how that affected the students in that course. And then I actually designed it complete quarter college course at, the, at Western Washington University and taught it in butterflies in 2011. We'll talk about the disaster that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for those of you who are wondering, who came to this hoping to know if you are so inclined to make your own course, what topics do I include in a good butterfly course? I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to tell you what to include. This is more the format. What formats work, what don't. Uh, because, namely, there's three, there's three main questions you want to ask yourself when deciding what do I want to include. And that is, what do you, the facilitator, the teacher, uh, want, to, want the students to take away from this? Whatever length it may be. Uh, what do the students want to take away from this? And you have to consider this one because I met quite a bit of resistance from my college course because what they wanted to take away what I wanted to take away were two very different things. <laughs> So I had to end up yielding to my students. And secondly, or lastly, what are my time limits and other limits on me? We'll talk about those varying limits as we go through it. So um, there are a couple of things, though, you are going to have to include in a butterfly course. Namely, we catch this. What's the first question that comes up? What is it? That's the, first, that's the first question. So there's going to have to be some identification, whether that's getting them to, uh, to understand family. If you have a limited amount of time, maybe say how to recognize a swallowtail versus how to recognize a brush foot might be enough for a one-day course. Um, what's the second question that usually follows? What is it? I hate it. <laughs> that's just yours. <laughs> huh? Gender. Could be gender. How do you know? Yeah, why? So, just testing, so Pelham can't answer. What is it? Just testing, guys. Me? Not, except Pelham. <laughs> okay, first group. <laughs> it, yep, fritillary. Anyone, anyone for a guess on species? Can I? <laughs> Go for it, Pelham. I'll get the genus. I gotta get some more ammonia. No, it was that was down Rainy? that was down on Tan and Tan of Canyon. Oh, Zeranian. Yeah. Zeranian. Yeah. Uh, second, you you're gonna see. Little, did you tell us what species it was, or did you not? Zerini. Zerini. Yep, I thought it was Zerini. He thought it was Zerini. Good enough for me. <laughs> uh, secondly, you don't just see, you don't just catch butterflies and look at and, and look at them in forceps. You observe them. 
And you're going to have a lot of different behaviors that are going to get the students asking, oh, what are they doing there? You get two butterflies back to back, well, what are they doing? Um, you see, this isn't really the best photo for this, but uh, during some of my classes I've had female butterflies, and the students didn't know they were female, but they found a female butterfly that was particularly interested in foliage, not flowers. And so the students are like, what is, she, what is it doing? It's a female looking for a place to lay eggs. Um, when you see a bunch of butterflies on a turd, <laughs> you're going to get a lot of questions about that. So having some backup as far as basics of butterfly behavior. Yes, Paul? Okay, so I want to know what you tell your students when you see a bunch of butterflies on a turd. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're the new butterfly student. Care to answer? You know what they're doing? They're eating it. Or tasting it. They're well, tasting it. What are they specifically looking for? Minerals. Minerals. Salts. Minerals, salts. I think with a lot of carnivores, cats they're looking for a lot of amino acids. Amino acids. Yeah. yeah. So basically, it's males trying to pump up their spermatophore for the ladies. Oh, oh. Um, secondly, or lastly, you're going to get a lot of questions as far as why. And this is where. Uh, your knowledge may be limited, or maybe you can expand on it, or you can say, let's explore that question together. So you're going to get questions like, well, why is that butterfly so colorful? And of course, you know that's not a butterfly, that's a moth. But you know, you might not look, jump into aposematism. Uh, you're going to say, okay, I know that's a hair streak, but what's up with those tails there? Uh, you're going to get questions like, well, why are the male and female butterflies often so differently colored or differently sized? And why are there some species that there is no difference? Um, you're going to get all those questions. So, between identification, behavior, and some kind of evolutionary biology, you're going to want to have some topics at the ready. But as far as what topics to include, that, var that varies on the format of the class. Um, how much do you want to throw in about plants, host plants, nectar sources? How much do you want to include about larvae, given that the butterflies are only one quarter of the stages? Uh, do you want to talk about their biology? Do you want to talk about how to find immature, immature stages, whether it's eggs, categories, or pupa? How much do you want to include about taxonomy? Do we want to, you know, beleaguer the newbies with, uh, with Latin? Do we want to demonstrate that butterflies are, in fact, just colorful moths? How much do you want to include on taxonomy? Uh, John Bauman did a similar, he did a weekly course with weekend field trips, he threw in a battle about glaciation and its effect on our region's fauna, and he threw in some butterfly gardening. So it depends on what the instructor knows, what the instructor wants them to take away, as well as what do you think the students want to take away. Uh, I mean, my ideal, I can't, not only is not here, so I can't thank him for showing this. This is Whistler Meadow off the north end of Highway 20. This little patch here. I've been seeing it for years that I've driven by. My goal, my ideal, would be that students would be able to look at this and know the different places they'd go look for different butterflies in the landscape. Um, Pio has always said that it's one of the most rewarding experiences where you can be thrown into a new habitat and, and predict what butterflies you'll see and find them. So, Whistler Meadow from a distance looks like one kind of big grassy green lawn, but when I went, there are three sections of this meadow. There's this wet lower area. There's a dry but still herbaceous meadow with different species of butterflies and flowers in the lower section, and all those rocky areas have influences of eastern Washington. We get things like I'll get things like blue coppers and mountain parnassians out there, flying alongside Clodius parnassians from those meadows. It's a terrific place, um, but often time limits are a problem. So in one day trips, can I really expect them to come away with that much knowledge? Not really, it's one of my limits, time. So the one day trips are first of all a lot of fun. I can't believe I could pay for this job. Um, so I take students, out to eastern Washington, the Cascades, depending on the time of the year. Uh, most of them have never been to eastern Washington or the Cascades, given a lot of them are transfers. They're just, they just have lived in Seattle. They just lived on campus. Uh, so this is often a big moment for them, too, as far as exploring their new home. Uh, but 
a lot of times with these field trips, they get the sense they're just going to get there and be lectured at. And I hand each one of them a butterfly net. And they get excited. And they say, we're, we're actually going to catch them. Yes. So there are some challenges with the one-day trips, namely weather. I plan, we plan these field trips out two months in advance, so we don't know what that particular day is going to hold. I'll say the season's weather, given that two months in advance, you don't know how the season's going to shape up. Is it going to slow down? Is it going to speed up? Is it going to dry out? Uh, this, this, week, this year was um, a great example of that, where everything was looking great, and then it just dried up quickly. Uh, so you have to adjust where, I have to adjust where I take my students almost up to the day, based on how the weather's been behaving. And topics depend on what presents itself. So as much as I would like to discuss convergent evolution on how all these butterfly, all these groups of butterflies have independently um, developed these tails to prevent bird attacks, I gotta wait for two of the three groups to come up before I can talk about convergent evolution. Sometimes they don't do that, so I can't talk about it. So weekend classes were um, this becomes less of a problem. Uh, so this is the first, this was my first class in butterflies, my first real foray into native butterflies. Otherwise, I got inspired to get into butterflies via the Woodland Park Zoo's butterfly exhibit. The old one, not the new one. I haven't yet checked out the new one yet. I need to. Um, so the weekend classes, you have a small group similar to the, to the day trips from UW. Similar to the day to the day trips, small group, but for a longer period of time, you get a bit more camaraderie there. These are your fellow students who are often at similar stages in learning butterflies um, as you are. More time equals more opportunities, whether that's for more favorable weather, rather than just the one day, you got a couple days to work with. Uh, for more species and habitats, you can take them to different spots. Uh, you have more time for more topics and discussion, uh, but this can be a bit intense as far as people trying to fit too much into basically 48 hours. Assuming you get there about midday Friday, leave sometime midday Sunday. On another note, one thing that has always frustrated me at the very beginning of my teaching career, beginners do not know that they don't know. For example, in, in winter I'll take students up to Skagit County to look at the migrating flocks of swans and geese we had an American bitter fly over us, low, like five feet above us. And me and my fellow trip, fellow van driver who drove the other van were both, he was a bird too, and we were both ecstatic, like, <laughs> that thing! And it's flying over and all the students are, it's brown. Why are we getting excited about, I uh, don't understand! <laughs> I did decide I was guilty of the same thing. Let me get started. This is a bird? It's a bird. <laughs> it was an exa it's another example, John. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, every year. Aren't birds just big butterflies? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> as soon as you can catch a, a bird with a net, I will consider it. <laughs> so, but I was guilty of the same thing in my first trip with uh, Bob Powell. So this was the view of the cabin that we were staying in, this little meadow out here that uh, the couple who owns the property has been kind of managing and taking care of. And we saw a dozen Mardon skippers. Me being an 18-year-old, kind of thought, well, it's kind of cute and fuzzy, but what's the big deal? And I haven't seen a Mardon skipper since. I didn't know that I didn't know how spoiled I was that weekend. What's the difference between a Marlin skipper and a Woodland skipper? Oh. Yeah, David, come on, man. Flight season. Have they determined if they're specialists on hosts or if they're still kind of generalists? No, they're all grass feeders. You know they're, 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 they're all grass, well, they're all grass feeders, but some of them are more specific. There's obviously the Woodland skipper is the generalist grass feeder. But these guys are a bit more restricted with as far as stage of the habitat. And these are a spring. These are a spring flyer versus woodland skippers are fall flyers, late summer fall flyers. That's they, the main difference. They, I, they look different too. They. <laughs> this is the top side. I know they all kind of look the various themes of orange and black. Well, the ventral hind wing, you know, hind wing median spot band is composed of quadrate, subquadrate spots, and <laughs> silvanoids in their rounder end. 
<laughs> so, I'm just saying, I'm guilty of the same thing, but what's one thing as a teacher you have to remember? Okay, they're not going to be excited about the super rare thing. It's so, okay, they don't know that they don't know. So, the week long class, same benefits, often increased as the weekend classes. However, you've got a big potential for burnout here as the week goes on. And namely, my example of this was my uh, week long class, Butterflies of Sierra Nevada with Paul Loeffler. How many of you have heard of Paul Loeffler? Yeah. Uh, so this was hosted by the Sierra Nevada Field Campus. If nothing else from this from this particular presentation, go to this course. I put it off for far too long. You're hosted um, near Calpine, California, at 5,600 feet. I was spoiled with the amount of California sisters that are around that I at first mistook for Orphans Adams because that's all I see around here. And so that was another Orphans Admiral, and one of the locals said, "Looks yeah. yellow for." What's that? Yellow wingtips. Is that a, an aberration of the camera? That was the glare on the camera. No, they're orange. They're, they're orange, orange. Oh, thank no, you, thank you. That's just a completely overexposed photo. Um, I mean, the meadows are great. The landscapes are great. Go take this one. It's five days. Um, and then stay for the moth course, which is another two. Did you have a question? No? Okay, yes. okay cool. Um, so, first of all, Big round of applause to Paul and his wife, Afi, um, who put up with all of us who had the energy to keep up. And actually, it's a lie. We could barely have the energy to keep up with him. Um, so that's one of the big takeaways with this. If you ever teach a course, you, you've got to put forth the enthusiasm. If you are going to teach something, there's an obvious reason why you're teaching it. It excites you. It drives you. As an analogy, I'm going, to, I'm going to a different subject now. I had two soils classes at UW. One was in the fall, as things get dark at 8.30 in the morning, with a professor that talked like this. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, same amount of credits, was once a week, four hours, and a guy who could make dirt interesting. It was a field trip every single time. That guy could make dirt interesting. He had so much enthusiasm for his topic that even though I said I'm taking this to satisfy a prerequisite, he got me excited about it. Dirt is kind of cool. It, it really is. <laughs> it just drives my point across to word it that way. And so the enthusiasm of Paul Offer cannot be understated. This dude is 79 years old. And he out endurance us all with this. So to give you an example, this was as we're driving down a dirt road. The lead car stops. This 79 year old guy walk, jumps out. Starts running out these butterflies. Not that fast. <laughs> not too, I'm not exaggerating much. Much. Much is the thing. Um, but as much as you want to do, as much as you want to say, teach them as much as you can especially as you get into the weekend and the week-long courses. I learned, allow some time for rest and, re and reflection. I talked to some of the other fellow students of this course, and they said, this is one of the most intense courses we've ever taken. They've taken other courses up here from uh, animal photography to uh, wildflowers to uh, there's some geology classes, a number of art classes. And they said, this is by far the most intense class that they've ever taken. Paul Offler is no, no, um, yeah, slouch is a good word. <laughs> so as much as after a hot day, I wanted to rest by the Uber River and just kind of soak my feet in it and rest. No, it was field trip, dinner, meeting, go, go, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, do it all over again. Uh, so much too, I heard some grumbling from the students a little later in the week. They're like, oh, God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so allow some time for rest and, re and reflection. Um, which leads me to the weekly course. So this is the format that I taught um, for the Mountaineers, the Seattle branch, uh, in 2016, and the Seattle Audubon Society this year. And what John Bellman has taught, and I think is a really, really good format, in that you meet once a week in a class for a presentation about, oh, what did I, I focused on identification of the families, how to use a field guide, so that if you are presented with a butterfly, you now know how to use the field guide to find it. 
Um, and then, oh, what did I do for the last one? I think I did like, where to find butterflies? How do we look at the landscape and find, and find them yourself? Did you make those uh, the two hour meetings prior to Saturday's topical for the trips that you were going to take? Generally. But once again, given the field trip, I don't know what's going to present itself. I have ideas, but I don't really know what's going to happen. So basically it consists of two hour, week, two hour meetings and then a Saturday field trip following. So I did three meetings, two field trips. So similar benefits to the block centers, but the time between the classes and the field trips allows time for reflection, personal exploration as far as if they have questions they want to explore on their own time, and question development. They can come back to class and say, well, I found this, or I went to this park after your class and I found this. What's going on here? Um, it allows for better development of questions and a little bit more. People can take some personal responsibility as far as their, um, their level of interest in the course. So that so far have been, has been the um, my favorite format for teaching these courses. However, you'd think that more time is better, therefore a college course would be the best. And this was one, a disaster. I taught this before I taught, and I'll tell you many why. Many these seminars. Now many guys would be much better at it, given I know more about how to effectively teach. This, I was a beginner in this stage. Does anyone notice, oh, my mouse doesn't show up here. Does anyone notice what year I taught it in? Does anyone remember 2011? No, man, I'm really old, you know. Did they bring the whole spring? March 23rd, first day over 60. One of the latest winter flood scenarios on record. Snow on April, April 6th. Coldest April on record. 56 days between official sunny days. Two rain records in May. A tornado on May 27th. <laughs> Finally, 70 degrees for two minutes on May 20th. The next 70 degree day won't come until June 4th. And that's when we're getting out for summer break. Fourth coldest May on record. Didn't hit 80 until July 2nd. The joke was that... No, that's not a joke. That actually happened. The joke was that the title was actually Researching Butterflies and Rain. I didn't have enough space to an infant on the registrar, but um, we had one field trip. I wanted to get students out in the field, so I had to kind of make stuff up as I went uh, to entertain them, essentially. So, but the fact that I did teach a butterfly course in 2011 says you can teach it any time. Secondly, so first of all, I had, I had weather against me. Secondly, look at that schedule. What, what's missing? That was one. Well, that, that, would be up in the Pierre, that would be up in the Pierre Day, week one. So this is basically going through and how to identify butterflies. But as a student, what else would you want to see? I mean, so far this is all just identification. Week 9, I finally get the methods of field research, and then week 10, oh, finally we have some diversity in courses, not just how to identify stuff. So I could have varied up the topics a little bit. And I expected them, by the way, to learn all 150 species of butterflies <laughs> in one quarter. And I'll tell you, so number one, I, I agree with you, I one in the back laughing. Yes, I agree with you. Over in the back laughing. That <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, everyone's mind works a little differently. What I used to do. I'm, I'm well aware of this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to say this as fast as I can. What I used to do is make flashcards out of pictures of butterflies. And wow, that would, that really worked fast. It has a lot of faults. You don't remember as well on and other things, but wow, it, 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 it's a good, good way to start. Many of the students did do that. However. So, so my rationale for wanting them to learn all 150 is that I took this course at University of Washington, ESRM 452, Field Ornithology. And we were expected to learn 180 bird species in the quarter, and we all did it. And it was easy for quite a few of us. We all got A's on the ID tests. Um, and it was, we were enthused about it. It wasn't a job, it was fun. So I don't know if that says something about the students at UW versus the student at Western, we won't get into that. But I said, if we can learn, 180 bird species enthusiastic. We should be able to do 150 butterflies, right? 
I got quite a bit of pushback on this. So what I wanted them to take out of it was not what they wanted to take out of it, so I had to readjust things a bit. And another thing, so purpose of the course, I'll sum it up. Primarily the course will illuminate a taxon of which there is much public interest and conservation concern, yet the whole course only focused on ID and field methods. Could have had them research a couple of fish and, wild, fish and wildlife species of concern or something like that. Maybe compare and contrast two species in their, and the challenges of their conservation. Uh, maybe looked at, maybe had them do weekly walks in a habitat near their home and look at phenology. I could have had individual projects, all that kind of stuff, but it was just ID. That was it. Nuclear course grade. It's all ID quizzes. So I made this class way too simple. I could have, for those who those students who weren't into ID, I could have expounded on, on numerous other topics, but I didn't. Once again, this was my beginning stages of teaching. So between the weather and my inexperience, this class would have been a whole lot better. But um, I'm going to let you answer, answer this. What is the main thing? The main component that any successful class, whether it's butterflies or birds or mycology or plants, what is the main component of a successful trip? What should you always include in your in your class? That they have fun. We'll have fun. I already kind of gave away. I said I should have said a successful class. Variety, enthusiasm. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I've learned if you ever want a successful class. You have to get them out in the field. Can you imagine a surgeon who's mm -hmm. never even practiced on a dummy who said, no, I read all the books, I'm confident. Mm -hmm. Or a forester that has never touched a tree. No, this is, why, this is why students sign up for it. It's not to learn in the books, it's to get out in the field and actually enjoy the bugs uh, that they're reading about, they're seeing all these pictures of. Shirley, I picked up your book here. Yeah. I know, it's I, it is, yeah. I'm not getting it back. <laughs> yeah. I know these pictures don't do it justice. This just inspires me to get down there and see them for myself. So same thing as going through a textbook and seeing all these pictures of butterflies. Makes you want to get out there and actually look at them, catch them. It's what makes us happy. That is, that's my sister. She'd be angry if she knew she was in this presentation. <laughs> Wait a minute, what, what butterfly was that? What do you think of? Well, um, okay, so what kind, what kind of butterfly, not species, what kind of butterfly, folks? Okay, so it's a fritillary. Anyone have an idea for ID? Well, you know I do. I know you do. I'm waiting. How can you answer the question? All right, fine. You answer the question. You took the question. I think that's Coronas. Absolutely. Yeah. That was up at uh, Samuel de Sac. Yeah. Anyway. So, the field trip. This is where students can finally practice what they've learned in the class. And I say face reality and its real complications, namely in a PowerPoint presentation, I can make a little blue as big as a swallowtail. And they say, oh yeah, in this blue you're looking for that spot right there. And oh, you see enough? And you give them a little half inch blue and they go, that little spot right there? Like, that's what you're looking for. Um, wear and tear on butterflies, you get a ragtag little butterfly, what is it? Those are, that's reality that they have to face. Uh, I see shadowing the experts, kind of, they get to watch their teachers and they get to gain insights into how the experts perform in the field in ways that the experts cannot really consciously interpret. They've just done it forever and it's part of their, you know, it's part of their, it's how they do things and they don't consciously think about it anymore. Students can watch that. Uh, they don't. Yeah, you're talking about me. You know. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about none of them. I'm talking about pile. I'm talking about you know. I, I would say that shadowing is perilously close to stalking. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is that the person who's being shadowed knows they're being followed. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> not, not that I know that from personal experience at all. Um, just another hint, I've also found it best if multiple spots are visited, rather than just say one spot. Um, ecology is better demonstrated this way, they get a wider perspective. And, I mean, I don't want to say that 
I don't want to admit that people get bored with butterflies, but one, they might get bored with a spot. So one of my favorite places to take students in spring in eastern Washington is the Ontanum Creek area. So what we'll do is we'll head down Ontanum Creek Recreation Area and we'll stay, spend about two hours down there. How many of you have been down there? Both of these spots are where we where Wild is taking trips. Ontanum Creek across that really bouncy suspension bridge. Fun spot. And so we'll see a lot of the typical eastern Washington butterflies there, Anna Swallowtails, Becker's Whites, uh, you name it. And then I'll take them around up to Weenus Road, up to the Ontanum Creek, uh, what do you call this? We call it Ontanum Creek Trailhead. The difference between the two spots is about 10 miles and 1,200 feet. That's enough to get them to look at phenology. It's spring is a little earlier, the season is a little earlier up here. And while they might be finding some ragtag and a swallowtail up there, up there, mid fresh. You can say, hey, they haven't been flying around as long. The season hasn't been, isn't as progressed as down low. There's just a couple of um, just zoom ins of the spots. Both of these are wild field trips. You guys remember any field trips from here? You do Venus Road a lot. So, yeah, so you're going to do one thing in your course get them out of the field. That's the biggest thing. That's where they can actually learn. They can actually practice what they've learned in the class. Otherwise, it's something they're going to forget if they don't have any real tangible memories to uh, attach to it. It's where they can practice the field methods. So what, what's with all the moths and butterflies on people's faces? Is there some attractant uh, on people's noses that we don't know about? Salts? No. Uh, could be, could, well, could be, you know, an enthused butterfly teacher that's uh, trying to imitate one of his teachers. But that, that's not on her nose, by the way. That's on, just on a finger. Climbing up her nose. Sure. <laughs> um, practicing looking for the immatures. But don't forget a break and a treat. So one of my rules is if, if the temp's over 75, this is during summer, if the temp's over 75, and it's going to be sunny, I always bring a watermelon for my students. A watermelon? A watermelon. There's only eight students. All right. I mean, we usually fin finish it. Um, but it's, it's welcome by then after running around 80 degree weather. And, I tell them if they're going to be in eastern Washington, they got to wear long pants because of the rattlesnakes, and they often don't have any special specialty pants. they got jeans on, so they're hot. They haven't brought enough water. They're not used to this environment, so they're just dragging by the end of the day. And I pull out a watermelon, and you cannot believe the relief on their faces. <laughs> All right, so always also provide them with further exploration. So basically give them the resources for those that want to continue their education. Um, they can further their learning and maybe contribute to the field as well. And basically sums up, you can't learn or cover everything in one course. You can't. So, tell them about us. <laughs> Once again, Ivy's class, and I'm hoping that my future class at Seattle Bond will bring in more new um, folks to the Washington Butterfly Association, more people on our field trips to enjoy uh, the butterfly resource. And these days, I can deliver them, I can deliver, I can suggest them multiple books, but these days with all the prolific, uh, prol uh, proliferation of web sources, and these are free, I can just give them a page of web sources from Butterflies of America, more pictures than any field guide could ever possibly do. Um, further resources to look into mods, give them something about, give them Roads into different bug communities. Uh, I often call butterflies the, the gateway bug. Because <laughs> while you're out there, yeah, they're pretty, they don't bite, they don't sting, but while you're out there, you notice the bees, you know the, notice the moths, the beetles, the flies, and it gets you into all the other bugs in there. Send in the bug guide where there's a big community of people that help you identify stuff and take your records. Um, once again, ways to contribute. I tell them all butterflies and moths in North, North America, namely, submit a sighting how they can help contribute to our knowledge of phenology and locations of our butterflies. And you're in charge of Washington. I'm in charge of, oh gosh, I'm in charge of Alaska, BC, Alberta, Montana, Washington. 
Oh, I have 150 records waiting for me at home. Are there people, experts who live from all over North America? Yes. Every state, every state has a, has a, every state has a, has a, has a coordinator. Question over here. What's up? Uh, you know iNaturalist? That's another one. I'm, I'm getting older, so I'm not getting into the younger stuff. So yes, iNaturalist. Also, I have, dis I, have a, I have a disdain for apples, so. I am iNaturalist, man. It's Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's all I have. But I would like to open it up for those of you who have, who have taken uh, maybe ID's course, those of you who may have taught courses, those of you who have taken Piles courses. Was there something I didn't hit on here? It said, no, no, you totally forgot blank that made it everything, why I'm continuing butterflies. Or maybe in the different sense, like, whatever you do, one instructor did this, don't do that. Danny can answer because I was an instru instructor for mm -hmm. it's a quick question. And yeah. At the beginning of a class, it might be too late to do this, and it's a long class, but do you ever take votes on what people would like to do? Even if it's not for that particular, it could be people from a different time for a future class, you know? So, two weeks, two, three weeks into my college course that I was teaching, um, I got the sense that people were not happy with learning that many species, that there was some pushback, and so I actually said, please write down what you want to get out of this course and, re and submit it to me, and then I took into account and made new PowerPoints. And, but like I said, as much as they wanted to learn about different things, weather was against us that year. And so any ideas? Once again, I'm, learning, I'm looking to learn from you, too. Doing uh, how you can improve habitat for different species. So once again, that, that, might, that might be along the lines of how people can further give them resources for butterfly gardening, how can they further their learning. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking for topics, but that would be one to include as far as further explanation. John, John Bauman threw some, some butterfly gardening in his weekly courses, in his weekly course over in Spokane. Um, but I'm saying like, but if someone had an unreasonable amount of work they expected you to do, or just, like I said, just looking to learn from you guys, yeah. So, so this has nothing to do with butterflies, really. Sorry. Well, okay. But that's but, not what this is about. So when I, I took, uh, uh, I've taken a couple of courses with Dennis Paulson, mm -hmm. um, North Cascades Institute, and the thing that always struck me about him and his courses, and very often they were week week in long course, two and a half day long courses. The thing that struck me about him was that we go out and the course is on dragonflies, right? So you would think that all you would do is dragonflies. All of a sudden I hear, because I was the only one who was really interested in it, heart girl, come over here. And all of a sudden he'd sit there and he'd have a 15 minute long talk on Western toad. Why it's disappearing. Of course happened in, in uh, Western Washington and Eastern Washington, so now you don't have formation sites. And everyone was like, oh my god, we had no idea we thought we were just a warty frog. And the thing that I learned from him, he taught me as a teacher, was not to discount moments of serendipity. Because your students learn as much passion, like you were saying, enthusiasm from something that has nothing to do with the course and text, but you can always tie it in, and they will remember that, and then they'll remember what you're trying to teach them in the course. Good point. Of course, well, Dennis Paulson is a national treasure. He is. Yeah. He is. He is. And he knows a lot. I, I have yet to take a class with him. I need to do so before time proceeds any further. Um, one thing though, one thing I don't want to discourage is anyone who is thinking about teaching some kind of course, just because you don't know, don't know something about everything you might find, um, don't discount your own passion for that. So, so, so Dennis Paulson knows a lot about a lot of things. Um, so I don't want to discourage something and so, say, oh, I, don't, I only know a little about this, therefore I can't possibly engage in serendipitous moments like that. Don't discount that. Um, you see, you can approach your students of, as far as, you can approach that topic as a, <coughs> let's look into this together kind of thing. Depending on where you are, you might be out in the middle of the <laughs> You might be in the middle of the bad country, you don't, you know, you don't have Google at your, at your command, but, uh, yeah, just don't, 
you don't have to know a little bit about everything. So don't worry that your knowledge may not be as vast as Dennis Paulson. Few, <laughs> few, few are. Um, yeah, do you have students that know quite a bit about something that uh, they could take over and say, hey, let me talk about such and such? And tap not, not yet. I've had a couple of students on my bird trips who joined because they were already into birds, in which they contributed, but most of, the, most of the students I have on, say, the University of Washington courses are newbies um, to pretty much natural anything other than they can identify a crow or a pigeon, that's about it. Um, the Mountaineers course and the Seattle Audubon course, they can contribute more on the flowers. And I don't know plants as well as I'd like, but they were, these naturalists are able to jump in. They're looking to expand their naturalist knowledge. They know about this, they know about this, but they don't know about butterflies, that's why they're taking the course. But I don't know my plants as well as I'd like, so I'd say, hey, who knows plants? And someone was able to contribute there. My thing is, if a butterfly doesn't use it, doesn't use it. Uh, a butterfly moth doesn't use a plant. I don't know it. I'm a little biased that way. Yeah. Other issue: uh, How much do you uh, take opportunities for the immature stages? Here's an egg. Here's a pupa. Whatever. Um, that depends on how much, how many butterflies are flying. Because <laughs> generally, with generally people who have taken the course to find the butterflies, to find the adults. And there are days where we go, especially on the UW field trips, where it's kind of a <coughs> mediocre day for butterflies, and that's where, hey, we're going to go for caterpillars today because the weather calls it calls for that. Um, we might have numerous butterflies, but they might be one or two species. In which case, after an hour, students are going to look for something new. In which case, I'll go for butterflies, but uh, also I'll go for caterpillars. But I've had days where we've had you know 30, 40 species days, and just nets swinging everywhere, and they're like, what caterpillars? We're too busy chasing these butterflies. So I have situationally. Just you kind of have to keep gauging the students, their interest, and what the habitat or the weather's throwing at you. Any other questions or things I can learn from? So this is something you actually taught me on the field trip, but I really liked it. Um, you had. Um, you asked a lot of questions of us about what we expected to find. If we went by a little road, for instance, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, what, what do you think might be flying here? And I think that um, asking people to think about the habitat is really effective. And I remember that. Rather than just telling them, yeah, right. asking exactly. why. What, might you expect to see in this particular kind of environment and point out the, the clues that they can make. And that's what I'll often do with my students is yeah. I'll catch, say, a Parnassian, and rather than just tell them that's a Clodius Parnassian, I'll give them Pyle's book and say, here are two Parnassians, look at the recognition, tell me who it is. And they have to go through, the, through it and decide what it is. I give them, I catch a blue and I give them that little, um, that little key, that little, that little, not my key, that's a bit too long for a day, for a day trip. But there's that, there's that spread of all the blues, the underside of the blues in Pyle's book. And I just tell them, which one is it? Use process of elimination, use whatever you got to do to get to it. And they're often very successful, but rather than just telling them, it's a little bit boring. They have to engage with it, they're going to remember it better. Anything else? Cool. But that's...